Hello, this is Tom Nappy here. Welcome to HCAM News Focus. I'm here with Jennifer Cray and Maria Flannery. And first off, we'll uh, have you both talk about why you're here today. Jennifer, we'll start with you. Sure, so um, as you mentioned, I'm Jennifer Cray with New England Organ Bank. We are the organ procurement organization that recovers organs and tissue from deceased donors so that we can help people who need those gifts to survive or greatly have their lives enhanced. So that's the work we do at New England Organ Bank. And I run our volunteer program uh, at the organization. And I'm joined by Maria, who's actually one of our volunteers. All right, Maria, can you talk about what you do for the organization and why you're here today? Well, um, I volunteer because I'm a recipient, a two-time organ transplant recipient. So I have experienced it in a big way and wanted to help other people moving forward, um, going through a really difficult time and just bring more awareness. So um, we've been working together for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, many years now. <laughs> yep. I think it really helps when um, people hear from from people like Maria who's experienced it personally how donation has touched her life then I think people get to understand it a little bit better what it means and that it could affect any family anywhere okay uh, what encouraged you to get involved with the uh, donate life organization oh sure <laughs> so that was many years ago that was 16 years ago now um, I actually at the time I had some um, housemates that had already worked for a New England organ bank uh, in a clinical capacity. Um, and it just kind of worked out on a whim. I went there, checked out an open position, um, which turned into a year later the role I'm in now. Um, but when I interviewed, I knew right away that was the place I wanted to work. Just such a, such a positive mission, knowing that we're saving lives. Absolutely. Can you talk more about how Donate Life is helping people? Sure. So, um, you know, we are, um, of course, again, recovering those organs and tissues to help people survive. So, you know, someone may need a heart transplant. They might have um, a disease that um, has put them in organ failure, and their only chance of survival is, is a donor heart. Um, so that, you know, we can do that. We can recover a heart that will match that person and could save their life. Um, and what we're also doing it's getting out there in the public to let people know that um, we have this opportunity to save lives and all we need to do, any one of us, is just register to be a donor. Doesn't mean we will be a donor, because um, as you can imagine, at the time of our death, we have to look at everything clinically. Um, but if we're able to donate and help people, we've already made that decision. So that's what the Donate Life program is all about. Now, obviously, uh, regist uh, registering to be a donor is a big help to the organization, but what are some of the other ways that people can help the uh, Donate Life organization? Sure. Um, inviting us out to speak at, um, you know, different business and social groups, schools, um, uh, have us attend your community health fairs. Mm -hmm. um, we receive requests all the time to you know, participate in these events and that's a wonderful opportunity for us because then we can continue to reach the public and get our message out there and help people register, which is really easy to do. You can do it, you can do it right now if you're watching our show. You can just go online to donatelifenewengland.org and it takes, honestly, maybe a minute to register. And you never know, someday down the line, we might be able to save somebody's life just because we did register check that box. Um, we, are, we are a nonprofit. We're a 501c3 um, and we do have some um, people who make donations to us which is wonderful and any uh, monetary donation that comes to us will go into our public education fund so that we can continue to educate the public of course and help register more people and all of that means uh, that we're saving more lives. All right, now Maria, you're a uh, mm -hmm. two-time organ transplant recipient. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about your experience? Sure. Um, my health story started when I was 10 years old, actually on my 10th birthday. Um, I was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes, or type 1 diabetes. And um, I went through the first 20 years um, fine, other than adjusting to having insulin injections. It was fine, but started to have some of the complications that can come in some cases. Not everybody gets the complications, but I did. And um, in my late 20s, was diagnosed with renal failure. Um, had my first transplant when I was 30 years old and was fortunate enough to have my father be my kidney donor. And um, it went perfectly. At the time, I didn't realize um, how, how much more difficult it could have been because I was not on the waiting list. I received the organ when I needed it from a person willing to go to the hospital the day I needed it. So um, I thought it was hard at the time. It was. 
Um, I was getting very sick. I was losing my energy. Um, just life became very tiresome. <laughs> I'd fall asleep driving. In fact, I fell asleep driving at one point, um, hitting a telephone pole. I didn't realize just how sick I was getting and how exhausted I was. Um, but that was my first transplant. That was in 1994, and it lasted 18 years, which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And I got a lot of life out of those 18 years, adopted two children, married, um, traveled, lived like any other healthy person. Um, I went on anti-rejection medication, which is something you have to do every day once you've had a transplant, um, which for me had few side effects. Um, my life was just so much better overall. I, you know, couldn't complain at all about it. So that was my first transplant. Um, after 18 years, I started going through kidney failure again. Um, and this time, because I had already had a transplant, I had someone else's immune system in my system. So I was getting more difficult to match. And I was sensitized to 70% of the public. So any organ that came in, I was 70%, um, most likely 70% not going to match that person. So I had 15 people come forward, which was amazing. 15 potential donors come forward living, saying, I'll give you a kidney. And um, none matched, but to see that kind of support was incredible, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Several within Hopkinton, um, parents of children that played soccer with my daughter, and um, strangers, and extended family. It was amazing. So um, I was on the list. Um, waiting at the same time for a deceased donor. And I had decided that I, instead of just the kidney, I was going to list for a kidney and a pancreas. The pancreas, if I received it, would cure my type 1 diabetes. And the kidney would get me off dialysis and save my life. So um, I waited, and I got my first call. Uh, this kind of will describe how difficult it is to find a donor, too, or have a donor that matches you or has healthy enough organs. I got my first call in January of 2012. Um, I went in and stayed probably 10 or 11 hours. I was at Mass General Hospital. And um, it came back that the organs were, um, they, they were too damaged in an accident to use. Um, during that same visit, I found out that I had a 70% blockage in my left anterior descending artery. So I needed a heart stent and wouldn't have gone through the surgery. So I was pulled off the list and was getting sicker. I had a heart stent put in, but continued to get more sick. I was on dialysis, and that um, that's a whole other world <laughs> in itself. You, um, I was going three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings for four hours at a time, having the blood pulled out, cycling through a machine, getting cleaned, and putting, back, putting it back into my body. Um, my diet completely changed. Uh, so many food restrictions when you're on dialysis. Um, you stop this personal stuff, but you stop urinating when you're on dialysis and you're in complete kidney failure, so you can't really drink anything. My liquids were so limited. I could have about, you know, I don't want to say about 24 ounces of liquid a day. And then you start realizing how much has liquid in it, watermelon, ice cream, ice cubes, a lot has water in it. Um, so then I got a second call in um, August, uh, sorry, July of 2012, which was a whole seven months later. So it was seven more months on dialysis waiting for a donor. Um, when I went into Mass General, I waited, this was a shorter wait, I waited four or five hours and was told that the final cross match was not good, so it was not a good match for me. Sent home, I had a third call in August of 2012. Um, and again, the organs were damaged and couldn't be used. So it was hard because all three times that I went in, um, it would be at night, <laughs> and then I had to go back to dialysis the next day. So it just happened to hit on the nights before I'd have to go back to dialysis. And I had to be up at 5 o'clock in the morning in the car at 5.30 and hooked up on the machine by 6 in the morning. So by that third call, I was feeling a little devastated, um, just wondering how much longer it would go on for. And I was getting sicker and sicker. Um, my blood pressure <clears throat> was through the roof. Uh, very little control. My diabetes was more difficult to control being on dialysis um, and taking a ton of medication. So my fourth call came um, September 22nd of 2012. I had gone down to the um, Born Scallop Festival with a friend. Uh, I was not feeling good at all. She was very concerned about me going. My blood pressure was 220 over 110. 
um, and that's taking a lot of medication. And um, I just wanted to be out. It was a beautiful day. I wanted my daughter to be with, my friend's daughter was going, and I wanted her to enjoy the day. And we went down, and um, my cell phone buzzed, and I answered it. It was Mass General saying, come on up. We've got another potential donor for you. So we drove up, and I waited from, um, it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on the 22nd until um, about 5 o'clock the next evening on the 23rd. So it was almost about 24 hours waiting to hear if it would be a go or not. And um, I was told it would be, which was amazing. And um, <clears throat> a very un unique experience, because I think a lot of people would think that you'd just be so excited. But at the same time, I, I think more, what pulled on me more was knowing that a family was going through such tragedy. Um, so it's not this big celebration you're having. It's it's you know, you're seeing the bitter sweetness of it. Right. Um, so within an hour, they just did everything so quickly, had me hooked up to what I needed to be hooked up to, final x-rays and everything, to have, taking antibiotics and immunosuppression pills and rushed into surgery. And I came out 11 hours later with a new pancreas and a new kidney, and everything was working beautifully. So um, off dialysis that day, I uh, have not been back on. I'm very healthy now, and um, and diabetes free, which was just the icing on the cake. It just truly incredible. I had diabetes for 39 years, taking four shots a day, wow. and um, six finger sticks a day, and I haven't done any of that since the transplant. So I eat whatever I want. I don't have to count my carbs. I have missed. I calculated at one point. So far, I've missed about 5,000 insulin injections, wow. and about 7,000 finger sticks. So life is pretty good. <laughs> That's terrific. Yeah. yeah. So is there any residual effects at all or uh, anything that you need to do since the uh, transplant on an ongoing basis? Um, well, the first I take um, immunosuppressant medication. Mm -hmm. So um, there are three of those. They just keep my immune system down enough so my body doesn't recognize that there are foreign organs in it. Um, and there are a few side effects to those, but honestly, compared to, they're, they're minimal. To me, they're so minimal compared to what I had. And I was on a lot of other medications before um, to help me through the failure. So it was, it's just not big at all. <laughs> um, I was on several blood pressure medications. I'm on nothing now. In fact, I struggle to keep my blood pressure up. So it runs on the low side. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be careful um, about being around people who are sick. I had to avoid big stadiums like theaters or concerts or anything like that for the first six months or so. Um, and over time, they lower some of your medications. You never come off them, but they give you so many at the beginning because they don't really know what your body's going to require. Um, so they give you enough to make sure you don't reject as best they can. And then over time, they kind of customize it to what you need. Um, but no, it's, you know, very energetic. I walk four days a week, three miles, and pretty much do whatever I want, so that's, it's all good. That's terrific. You're a prime example about how this organization can mm -hmm. really help someone and change their life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that you know some other Hopkinton residents that have had organ transplants or have been helped through uh, this organization as well. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think, you know, I can't mention by name who they are, but there, I, there are other people within our own town, and I think that's what's um, difficult for people to see, that we walk around so healthy that you would never say that person had a transplant or, you know, expect anything or suspect anything, really. Um, but there are, there are other people in town. Um, I can tell you the town of Hopkinton is the people have been amazing or were amazing during my difficult times. The support I received was phenomenal. Um, and it said a lot about this community. So. That's, that's great, terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer, uh, could you talk about, and obviously we just heard an example here, it was because of diabetes why you needed the organ transplants. Uh, but could you talk about some of the other reasons why people end up needing an organ transplant? Sure. Um, you know, a lot of times people are born with the disease that progresses over time, um, and they'll go into organ failure, uh, end stage kidney disease, um, whatever it might be, and they'll need um, an organ transplant to survive, a donor organ. Um, kidneys, by far, most people who need an organ transplant um, need kidneys. And I think that's because of a lot of kidney diseases that are prevalent in our country right now. Diabetes, um, 
uh, polycystic kidney disease is another genetic disease that affects a lot of people. Um, so not to say if you have diabetes you will need a transplant, mm -hmm. um, but some people do go on to need a transplant. And so because of those diseases are so prevalent in our country, you can see how that starts to up the numbers. So right now we're looking at about 123,000 people in our country need an organ transplant to survive. And that's people of all ages. I mean, we know babies, mm -hmm. children, teens, um, uh, uh, seniors, and everything in between who need who, a transplant to survive. So of that 123,000 people waiting for hearts, lungs, livers, kidneys, pancreas, um, and sometimes small bowel, uh, 100,000 alone are waiting for kidneys. So that really shows you the need for that type of transplant right now. Wow. <laughs> Quite staggering numbers. They are, and, and to give you a little visual too, if um, to think about that number a different way, that would fill Fenway Park. The number of people waiting right now in our country would fill Fenway Park, Gillette Stadium, and TD Bank North. So when you think about those three sports venues filled to capacity, that's how many people are waiting right now. And we can help them. We, we know that organ transplantation works. Um, we just hope that more people will, will register so that if this is right for you, um, you, you know, declare your wishes by signing up and you might go on to help somebody like Maria someday. Now, Maria is a great story, and I'm sure working with the uh, Donate Life organization, you've seen uh, many of these great stories. Could you talk about some of the things that you've seen working with the organization? Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's always wonderful to meet people who've been touched by donation. So I know a lot of people who've received transplants like Maria, and some of them are children, mm -hmm. which really, you know, when you see a child, um, you know, uh, doing well, playing with their classmates, playing soccer, whatever it might be, any, any activity that any kid does, knowing that they can do it because they had a transplant, it's just it's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I also meet a lot of um, donor family members. So that means people who lost a loved one um, and then that their loved one went on to donate organs and tissue um, after their death. And so to meet those families mm -hmm. um, and to hear their perspective has always been really powerful for me. Uh, the, you can clearly see the benefit for a recipient, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to hear a family say how much donation has helped their family, they, they were um, in a situation where they lost their loved one. In the hospital, the medical team, they did everything to save that person's life. But unfortunately, we know people die, and you can't always save someone's life. Um, so for these families to tell us that donation was the one positive thing that came mm -hmm. out of this death, out of this tragedy, really helps them and they know that their loved one lives on you know through others um, and it's and it's helped those families so that always really sticks with me mm -hmm. to know yes we're helping people survive but we're also helping families that you know now have a legacy for their loved ones yeah how do you sign up to be an organ donor for those people that don't know? Sure, so it's, it's really easy. Anytime you renew your driver's license or state ID, um, it's right there on the form when you go to the RMV. Just check yes uh, to organ and tissue donation. And anyone can do it today. I know I pointed earlier to our sign, but donatelifenewengland.org. You can register there. And like I said, it just takes a moment. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I read on the uh, website was that the surgical need for tissue is steadily rising. Why do you think that is? Sure, sure. So when we talk so much about organ donation, you know, especially um, in the media, you hear when someone's had a heart transplant, for example, and things like that. But tissue is really important. So tissue, um, that need is increasing because we can help people with knee replacements, hip replacements, um, ACL. Uh, surgeries. Um, I've had one of those myself. Oh, you have? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, a lot of times those are done with um, deceased donor bone and tendons, and it's uh, it's amazing because you don't always realize that where those gifts came from. Right. Um, and so it's not life saving um, in your case in ACL, but it certainly helps though. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're probably pain free. Oh, yeah. um, and by doing these types of transplants with um, donor grafts, it's a better outcome for the recipient. Uh, it's an easier recovery. So let's say, for example, a knee replacement. If I were to have a knee replacement done with um, donor bone, over time my own bone would grow 
with a donor bone, and it's just a better outcome for me. Uh, for mobility, I won't need a follow-up transplant, so sometimes with other, other types, uh, titanium, you might need a follow-up transplant. Um, and there's other things too, reconstructive surgery, so, but we're talking about people recovering from different types of uh, surgeries from cancer, mastectomies. We can use skin grafts to help those people. So that's why that need continues to grow, because I'm sure you're aware more and more people have these different injuries, sports injuries, cancer, surgeries, so we can help those ways. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned that when you renew your driver's license, you can register to be an organ donor. Mm -hmm. Do you by any chance know the percentage of people that currently are registered to be organ donors? Sure, sure. Um, right now across the country and as well as here in New England, just over 50% of our adult population is registered. So that's really wonderful. Um, we have a great partnership with the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Um, if you go into an RMV office, you'll actually see Donate Life, our information there in the office. Um, and the clerks know, the RMV staff know that they have a key role in, in this. By having that question on the form and verbally asking people when they come up to the window to turn in their paper, their forms, when they're renewing their driver's license, for example, the clerk will now ask you, and would you like to register to be a donor today? And that one question makes such a difference because you know, you're giving the pe people the opportunity to say yes, if they'd like to, if this is right for them, um, and they could maybe someday save someone's life, yeah. Terrific. Maria, when did you uh, end up getting involved with this organization? Um, trying to think how many years ago. Um, oh, many now. <laughs> yeah, it's probably been maybe eight or nine years um, when I moved into the area and just looking of ways to help. Um, and I'm trying to think what my first my first event was, but we've done some of the health fairs at the high school and um, gone to high schools to educate students in their wellness classes on organ donation before they go to get their licenses. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, a while, yeah. So I'm sure based on your experience, you, you saw the work this organization is doing. And mm. I'm guessing you said to yourself, wow, I gotta get involved with this. I yeah. these guys out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got really, really close to some people on dialysis, and that's where I think um, things really started connecting for me because I lost some, some people that were sitting with me at dialysis, and you realize how, um, how fragile it all is and how quickly it can all change. And um, when I look at my center, which was in Milford, I was one of two that got out. Um, I say got out, <laughs> literally. Um, a lot passed away since I got my transplant. So the odds are not great when you're sitting in there of, you know, having someone just match you perfectly and, you know, you're all set in a week. It's just not that way. So I definitely feel that calling to help as much as I can. And, you know, when I go to the registry, I'm always thanking the, the person when they ask that question, I'm like, thank you so much. And I tell them my story and just say, you're making a difference. You know, it, it matters that you're bringing up that question. Well, I think uh, today we all saw how uh, this organization and just signing up to be an organ donor can really change someone's life and mm -hmm. it's pretty simple to do and one mm -hmm. last time can you just uh, talk to people about how they could help out the Donate Life organization? Sure, so visit us online, donatelifenewengland.org. Um, if you'd like to have us in to give a talk or set up a table, an event you're having, we'll be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we like to go uh, to different communities um, throughout Massachusetts, but also New England, which is our service mm -hmm. area. Um, and really, any one of us can help today just by signing up to be a, to be a registered donor. It just takes a moment to say yes to donation. All right, well, Jennifer and Maria, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining me today to talk about this great organization and the great work you guys are doing. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, well, that'll wrap up this edition of HCAM News Focus. I thank you for joining us. Have a good rest of your day, folks.